I want to take just a few minutes we have left and ask you to turn to John chapter 1. We read the better part of that prologue. I just want to call us back to John 1, 14 for just a few minutes. We've already read it together. Perhaps sometimes we read over things and we don't really take them in. Listen to this. Listen to this. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord willing, in the weeks to come, in December the 14th, 21st, and the 28th, I want to just take a, a brief series to think together, to remember Jesus by thinking about the birth and childhood of Jesus Christ. That's going to be coming. But today, we've celebrated the Lord's Supper. We've been reminded in the elements the powerful symbol of God's grace shown to us. He clearly said in that supper, if you go read the portions of, of the Gospels toward the end of each Gospel where, where it's recorded, do this in remembrance of me. But what do we remember about him? We are in this season again, this Christmas season. And I would submit to you that while you will likely pass by and maybe even put up in your homes what we call nativity scenes with a, a manger, a crib with hay and a baby. Perhaps shepherds, figurines of shepherds and perhaps figurines of, of the magi, the wise men with figures Mary and Joseph representing them a, you will pass by more of those in the next three weeks than you would do combined the rest of the year. Josh made an interesting point. These are hymns that tell about the coming of Jesus Christ that are worthy to be sung all year long. And if Jesus really is the meaning of Christmas, and in the very name itself, Christmas, Christ is in that, if he is the meaning of Christmas, and we're to remember him, then there's a sense in which, in our hearts at least, it ought to be Christmas all year long. But it's easy to forget him in this time. So think of me just for a few minutes on this verse. I want to just point out to you some things from the fact that, that the Word became flesh and the Word pitched His tent, the Word revealed His glory, and there's no one like the Word. This verse 14, by the way, is part of a group of verses, we won't look at them today, but 14 through 18, that was a, a confession of Jesus as the Word of God that was made by the early church. First of all, the Word became flesh. It's interesting what this says. In fact, when you look at the form of it, it means that a person or a thing changes its property or enters into a, to a new condition. It becomes something that it was not before. You know, as you read the prologue there, we know that the word the Greek word logos is a reference to Jesus Christ. He comes in the person as the word, just as God spoke in the beginning, let there be light, that, that 
creation from divine fiat where the speaking of God brought it into being and now the speaker for God comes. But he comes in a new condition. He comes as something that he was not before. He had existed from all eternity. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was face to face with God. And then the Greek says, and God was the Word. Jesus has existed from all eternity as the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God. But when he becomes flesh, he takes on something that he's never been before. <laughs> and the word flesh here is used not simply to speak of humanity, but when the scripture talks about flesh, it talks about weakness. He came into our weakness. He came as one among us. And so you sing things like meek and lowly. But when you remember Jesus, remember that he did not begin to be when he was conceived in the womb of Mary. Rather, remember that he has always been and he condescended, he lowered himself to be encapsulated in a human embryo to grow into full gestation in the womb of Mary. And when he was born in Bethlehem, that babe, he was something, someone he had never been before. Never had he confined himself to space and time. Second thing I want you to see is that Scripture says he, he dwelt among us. The, when you literally look at what it's saying there, he pitched his tent. The word pitched his tent. Now if you're a good Jew with good Jewish training, you know good and well that when you start talking about pitching your tent, that you're going to go back in your mind to when your forefathers were wandering in the wilderness and they would pitch their tent tent, the big tent, the tabernacle of meeting, and they would assemble their tents they lived in all around the tabernacle of meeting. So some paraphrases you may see will say, and he tabernacled among us. He dwelt among us. He did not live above us. He lived among us as one of us. So when you're hungry, Remember, Jesus was hungry. When you're thirsty, remember, Jesus got thirsty. When you're weary, remember, Jesus slept. We looked at this passage recently, but if you want to get an idea of how weary he must have been, he slept on a boat in the midst of a ferocious storm. Paul says in Philippians 2, he emptied himself taking upon himself the form of a servant. Jesus did not come to earth and simply observe. He came to be one among us. In the near future, when we move through this series, we're going to be looking back again at Mark's gospel, and, and it's amazing when we see how quickly he moved from that model of, I teach you watch to now you too go and do he was one among us the third thing I want you to see is that the word revealed his glory and this this was the this sealed the powerful symbol he pitched his tent and we, we beheld his glory. We gazed upon him. That's the word. Get. See, it's not glance. It's not 
thought about it for a moment. We gazed. John uses this in, this, in the gospel. When he writes the letter 1 John, he, he goes into more detail. That which was from the beginning, which we've seen, which we've heard, we handled, we touched it. Jesus was such a compelling figure that he commanded the serious study of people to, con to gaze upon him. You know, there were those who dismissed him, but most who encountered him, and we're going to see this in this series, had some type of a response to him. Very few ignored Jesus when he came. We held his glory. The, in the tabernacle of meeting in the Old Testament during the days of the wilderness wanderings, this big tabernacle that God had told them very specifically how to build, what shape it was supposed to be in, what its uh, elements were supposed to be, what it was supposed to be made out of. You know good and well that when, when they traveled in the wilderness and they were traveling at be a, a, a pillar of fire which would keep relative comfort when the desert temperatures would just drop to something unbearable, the children of Israel turned under this, this pillar of fire at night and, and it was a cloud by day to keep the sun from parching them. But when this pillar of fire, when this cloud stopped, because see it didn't follow them, it led them. When it stopped, they understood from God's instructions that the Levites carrying the tabernacle were to stop right there, wherever the cloud stopped, and drop everything and build the tabernacle right there. And only then would the other tribes, flanking three on each side, three in the front, three behind, only then would they then begin to assemble their tents, their dwellings. Powerful picture for us. Where we live and how we live and what we do should be tied to the leadership of God and the power of his glory revealed. When God would want to meet with the people in that day of wilderness wanderings, the Shekinah, a bright, a brilliant cloud, would come down and descend upon the tabernacle almost like a fog enveloping it. And it was the sign God will meet with his people. And the leaders would go. And they would summon the people. Because God was near in the Shekinah. You hear it referred to in some songs as the Shekinah glory. John says we, we beheld that. We beheld that glory. In his miracles, no one's ever done these things. In his teaching, no one's ever spoken like this one speaks. And as I said earlier, Peter, James, and John had the unspeakable privilege of being on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus communed and conversed with Moses and Elijah and talked about his departure, his exodus. Then I want you to see that there's no one like him. When, when John tries to describe Jesus in this, we beheld, we gazed upon his glory, and when we gazed upon his glory, his glory was that of one, the only, some, some people say the uniquely begotten. That's true, he is unique. But really the, the sense of that compound word, the only one of its kind. He is the Son of God, and we hope and pray by, by grace through faith that we will be sons and daughters of God here and be brought back to the family of, in, in, the, in the eternal recesses of heaven, that we will be called the children of God, that men can be called sons of God, women be called daughters of God. But you see, when you take on that term, sons of God, I'm a son of God by faith, I've trusted in Jesus Christ. Yes, you are, but you're not a son like he was a son. He was the only one of his kind. That's what the compound word means there. You could use it loosely of an only child. But when you have another child, then that designation goes away. Jesus 
is uniquely begotten. And this text tells us that he was full of grace and truth. Grace. God's unconditional love for those who do not deserve do not deserve his love. This is grace. If you're saved here today, there ought to be welling up inside of you all the time and me all the time a shout of hallelujah. We're going to sing a song as we close today. What can I do? But thank you. And say a hallelujah. A hallelujah. Jesus was full of grace and truth and is full of grace and truth. And his spirit comes as he promised and he saves us and he begins filling us with grace and truth. And so that's what Paul is after when he says, keep on being filled with the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. Grace, truth. And that's my desire for you this Christmas season. As you think about what's on your list, who's on your list to give, Children, as you anticipate receiving gifts, it's, it's good to give them. I've told you I enjoy doing that at Christmas time. I enjoy giving gifts, not just then, throughout the year. Children, as you think about what you're going to get for Christmas, let me tell you something. I pray that somehow you will be brought to meditate upon the wonderful reality of the person, the life of of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, attending that, and that you will realize that whatever you give, you may have gotten everything you wanted for Christmas, and, and that may be true for years past, but you will receive no greater gift than the gift of the grace of God as he offers Jesus Christ to you to be your Savior and your Lord. And my hope and desire and my prayer is that every one of us will sometime during this Christmas season <clears throat> have the renewing experience, the renewing encounter. We can say, you know, Pastor, I, I beheld again his glory. Awe inspiring, his glory. Transforming. That's his glory. And you won't necessarily look at what you don't get or you won't simply look at what you can't give, but you'll look upon Jesus Christ who gave himself for you and for me, whose very name, Jesus, the angel said this name means he shall save his people from their sins. Lord's Supper says, do this in remembrance of me. I want to add today, when you walk away from here, keep on remembering Jesus Christ. Let's pray.